Perfect. All right, folks. Um, again, this is, I'm Matt Corker, and I have the great privilege of uh, running the Corker Co. And today, I feel like we're in our last week of the program. And I just wanted to first give you a moment to step back and think, okay, this has been an 11 week journey. And what have you learned? What new skills you've gained? And also give yourself the ability to recognize all the effort and energy you've put in toward your business, the program, um, your partnerships in certain cases. Um, because often when we think about setting goals and looking ahead, we forget probably the most important thing, which is actually being able to reflect and give ourselves credit to, to integrate the learning that we've had over the last couple weeks. So um, to start us off, I would love to hear uh, three people come on and share what has been a big learning or lesson or aha moment you've had throughout this process that's really shifted your understanding of your leadership or your business um, or what you want to get up to going forward. So whoever would like to unmute first, uh, I'll call on your name so that we can, uh, you'll take us away. Aldo. Yeah, well, uh, well um, uh, I'm really happy, well, with the program because uh, during these weeks, uh, like I really got to understand my business a lot better. And like, I was kind of like, I always wanted to, to to be a marketplace but like i didn't really know uh, like the pains that i was solving or like you know a way like a more concrete way to start uh and well during this like couple of weeks uh we we chose a niche and like uh we are like we 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 know like in depth the the pains of our niche uh, which is the co-working spaces and well we're executing on that which is like uh uh well really helpful because like now we are like we know like before it was kind of like a blind person like we were just like trying to with a cane just like to you know to kind of like to find a way but like we weren't really like uh following any structure and like we now are like more much much more structured and uh yeah well like the the path is more clear now got it so not only um, were you able to identify and rejig your, the niche that you're going after, but you also have a more clear strategy to how you're going to actually execute. execute on it. Cool. Yeah. Well, well done. Way to go. Thanks for going first, too. Thank Appreciate you. it. Who's next? What can you celebrate the learning? Joaquin. Hi. Hey. And one of the ma main breakthroughs I've been through this process is to really pursue a business goal that you love, that you're passionate about. I did a major pivot during the, the program. Mm. So now I, I'm, I'm with another project that I'm really passionate about. And it's not only a business idea. And so, so what, what did you pivot... What did you pivot toward? What are you now uh, working on? So the first project was uh, like a gift marketplace. Now it's a completely different thing. It's about experiences and travel, but oh, wow. it's something I'm related to so I can really feel what I want to do with, with the project. Got it. Yeah, it's interesting because so much can change in such little time. So when we look at uh, going at going forward, it doesn't take a lot of time to make really significant shifts. You just change your complete business in 11 weeks. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Joaquin. Justin. All right. Um, one thing that, uh, especially since our last session, um, 
that's been super helpful is, well, I guess, so before when I was working with my team and we'd be scheduling meetings and everything like that, I, I always felt like I was kind of just flying by the seat of my pants a little bit. So, you know, uh, scheduling a meeting to talk about X, Y, Z, and then the next day talking about something unrelated. Um, so our last session, what we talked about, I forget the wording now that we use the first was that alignment. The second was that, uh, kind of exploratory imagination. Uh, the third was like kind of figuring out the pros and cons. And then the yeah. third was the, or the fourth was the fulfillment. Um, and then the last was the reflection. And I've been trying to put that into action with, uh, scheduling my meetings with the team. Um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about marketing, if we're talking about product development, uh, whatever, just kind of starting with that alignment, um, moving into that exploration imagination. And it's just made things a lot more concise. And I feel like our team has just had a lot more synergy because of it. So, um, I'm super excited about that. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm glad that that was helpful for me. Um, it, I use it everywhere. I'm like going into my social events and, my volunteer opportunities and even running the business, it, it, it feels, it's a, it's a tool that I love to lean on. So I'm glad that you're finding your own way through the cycles of success too. Awesome. Anyone else wanted to share? I know I said I was going to do three, but is there anyone else? Um, <clears throat> yeah, take it away. Just like tons of, of, uh, market validation. And um, I think the, the other biggest thing is like connections, right? So I think like in, when people start companies, they have this tendency to like, kind of put themselves in this echo chamber of just like, you know, staying closed and like, not, and just like, let's just work on the product and just focus on the product. And where it's more like, I think the biggest thing that I've done is sort of just like opened up and like started talking to like tons and tons of people and then taking feedback really well. So um, meeting with like other, you know, experienced entrepreneurs that have been successful and then them giving me advice and me actually taking that advice and following up with them. And then like, you know, really taking the heart and changing the way that I'm thinking based on the feedback that I'm getting. So that's like, I think the biggest thing for me, because with our first product that we built, it was like, okay, I have this vision and then we're building this thing and we're building it. And then we built it and launched it and like nothing happened. And then it was like, oh fuck. And so now it's like, you know, I'm t like taking in all this feedback, doing tons and tons of market validation. So we haven't so much, we, we have this like technology capability with payments. And so now we're trying to find this, like, who's the customer and then what's the secondary product on top of that payment thing that we can sell. And so now we're sort of like just validating, validating, validating before we build. And like my buddies, uh, you know, James and Nick are like sitting there like, so when do we get to start coding? Like, when can we start coding? You know? And I'm like, I'm like, no, we're not coding. Like, stop. We're just like, we're like doing all this validation. We're doing all this planning so that, and interestingly enough in the software cycle, uh, as we do all this, as we do all these things, when we actually get to the software, if everything is planned out and everything's validated, the software takes so much shorter of a time to build because everything is done and we don't have to change anything as we're building. So the biggest thing for people that are building software is changing the software as you're building it. So if you're an engineer and you're trying to build something and you have the CEO come over your shoulder and go, Oh, by the way, we're not doing that anymore. We're doing this other thing. Right. So like, that's, that's the biggest thing for, for me is learning that do all of this planning up front, the 90% and then the coding can be this 10% at the end and it just becomes much easier. That's my thing. I love it. And it goes to show that all of the work leading up to a launch actually makes the launch successful. So rather than yeah. it being this, like, okay, we're going to build this thing in secrecy and then launch it. And every, like, if you build it, they will come. It actually takes a lot more than that to make sure that the right people even know about it, that you're building it. So they yeah. get excited about it when you launch. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. One of, and it, what a great segue because um, when we're talking about, today we're talking about vision and goals. With the last week of LOI, what we really are committed to doing is making sure that you have a trajectory of things that you're looking forward to within your own life, but also within the organization or the little um, startup that you're working on right now. So that it doesn't feel like, now what, at the end of it. 
And I wanted to clarify uh, some specific language that we'll use because in the world today, you know, we'll hear a lot about goal setting. You can Google right now, top 10 ways to goal set, and you'll be able to get some really good resources. You'll also be able to Google why goal setting sucks and get 10 really good resources on why you shouldn't set goals and why goals are not uh, productive. And so I wanted to address those two things to start. The first being, um, why do we set goals in the first place? And for me, I look at it so pragmatically. One way uh, for me, my own personal experience about having goals is about creating alignment to increase efficiency on my team. At the end of the day, that's really why I set goals with my team and with my business. Personal goals aside, focusing on just the, my like, team goals and project goals that I have at work, the more that we share a common understanding about where we're going, the less that I need to second guess or, you know, Justin mentioned the cycles of success that we had before, like the connect and align conversation can become really quick. It doesn't need to be as in depth and take a lot of time and get people on board and rally the troops. It's more like, hey, everyone's still clear that this is our goal. Yep, cool, moving on. And it gives people that opportunity to engage with the work in a very clear and efficient way. So I just look at it like goal setting for corporate, for corporations and for teams is all about creating efficiency. The second piece is right now we're hearing a lot of like, well, just do something and see if it works. Do some, like see if it sticks. Um, you know, Matthew may have a, a different perspective on the like launch it and just like see if it works. Um, and he, he mentioned all of the work that he's now doing to, to make sure that it's intentional and it's backed up by things. And that goes against a big movement of like, let's just go with the flow. Let's just like, I want to be able to be adaptable and I don't know anything right now. So I don't want to set something in stone. I don't want to commit to something that, you know, may not be applicable to me in a couple months or in a couple years. And I love that. I love that philosophy of being able to be adaptable and being able to uh, pivot when you need to. What I offer though is setting a goal is like going on a road trip. And we need to know if we're going to Kelowna or Montreal or, you know, uh, none of it, because those will demand different resources depending on where you're at. So knowing where you're going and knowing where you're at are two important data points for us because, you know, if I was in Vancouver, Canada, and I was going to Montreal, you know, I probably wouldn't take a boat. And I probably wouldn't hitchhike. I probably wouldn't drive. I may take a plane. Or, you know, if I was feeling luxurious, I may take the train. But there's these uh, options of how I get there, the way in which I get from point A to point B change if I'm clear on where my point B is. I can be flexible in my approach. I can take a detour and get off the highway if I wanted to take a detour on the highway, but it gives me a lot of, it, it makes my yeses and my noes more clear, which goes back to the first point of being like, that way your team can be more aligned on what work to do and what work not to do. And so that being said, I wanted to hear, from you in terms of like, do you have set goals? Are, do you have goals for your team and what kind of goals do you have? So I'd like to hear from two different people around, you know, what do you currently have in practice right now? You could also say, I have nothing and that would be valid as well. <laughs> um, we, um... We started using the, um, the OKRs. So we started using, we're not, we're not, I guess it's like a goal, right? I mean. 
So for everyone who doesn't know the objective, the acronym objective is a high level uh, result that we want to see occur. And then a key result are the objective and specific proof that roll up to that objective. So um, the key results would be more like mini goals that ladder up to a larger one. OKR. Take it away. Um, yeah. So let me just pull up the ones that we had that we set. So we set like um, our OKR is for May. So we had like successfully pitch at LOI Labs event is one for me. Um, design our MVP and deliver the sketch files for that MVP for our, for our product. Um, and then have all the issue ticket, the software issue tickets created. So that's another kind of goal for the month. And then um, my partner, James, uh, he has to document all the processes for our operations um, and then also work on me, work with me on the issue tickets. And then he has to reconcile um, our current backend software with the new issue tickets that I create. And so that's our <laughs> OKRs for May. And then what we also did was created a weekly goal that led to the monthly goal. Okay. So what program or what tool are you using to keep track of your goals right now? Uh, we use Dropbox Paper. And then what we do, we use Dropbox Paper for the meeting because it's in Markdown. So it's really fast to write them out. And then what we do is we translate those Dropbox Paper to-dos into Asana. And then in Asana, we track those. Um, and then you can create like sub issues of big things in Asana. And then that's how we're, that's how we've, um, divvied it up. And then in Asana, we have this like high level overview, business development, customer discovery, project execution, and then process design. So a lot of what uh, my partner James does is he does a lot of this like process design now. So he, you know, is designing how do we, if we're designing a user interface, what's the, de what's the process for designing that user inter interface so that we have that all documented. So what I love that you distinguished here for us is the difference between uh, a task and a goal. So there's a larger goal that some of these tasks ladder up to. And what I always say is that um, goals don't show up on your to-do list, but your tasks will show up on a to-do list. The tasks that ladder up to a goal should show up on your to-do list, but a goal, it's not like, um, unless you have a specific measurable um, metric that you need to hit every day. So for example, uh, uh, like close five deals this week, you may actually have smaller items or smaller uh, to do's each day to make sure that it ladders up. How are other people's relationship with goals? What are other um, ways or processes that people follow? Um, Justin. He uses Trello right now. Um, but I guess our, our biggest goal is to launch our beta um, in August, end of August. Hmm. And with Trello, are you, how do you organize your, uh, so do you use like an OKR system as well or? Yeah, so we basically have columns of um, like a to-do list, task list, and then in progress, completed, um, and then, so if I'm talking about development, then like a, a bugs or a, you know, a red flag or, uh, and then we have a, a changes um, column as well. And then for our UX UI, uh, same sort of deal. So we have like a sitemap strategy column, um, a content strategy column and a, a UI column. And then with that one, we actually use it a little bit differently. Um, we, we just color code it for uh, what's being worked on and what's completed. So. When it's being worked on, we call it color yellow, it's completed, green, etc. Cool. Okay. Well, I'm going to highlight uh, four commonalities between what Matthew and Justin just shared for us so that we can start to see, you know, regardless of what method you use or the system in which you record your goals in, there's four different characteristics that are super valuable. The first one is that it's documented and shared. So if you're looking at your goals right now, simply putting them on a Google Doc, 
a Dropbox paper, an Excel spreadsheet, a Google sheet, like whatever it is that you do, making sure that they're clearly documented, written down, and they can easily be shared. Shared can be virtually through like an Asana or a Trello or one of the previous um, items that I mentioned to you before. But it could also, if you share a workspace, you may actually post them on your wall maybe um, so that they're more of physical representation. So shared doesn't necessarily always mean technology, but it does mean that they're written down and they're shareable for more or they're easily accessible for multiple people. The second, and the reason we, we do that again, is that ease of, ease of access creates more efficiency for your team. When I know what goals the company is working on, when I know what goals my team is working on, then there's speed in decision-making and speed in the conversation around certain projects or to-dos. The second is that there's a quantifiable measure of success. So when I'm thinking about a goal, um, having a goal that says, um, uh, that, it, that is vague or it doesn't create a strong uh, pull toward action is what I would call a not very successful goal. Um, and so an example of something that had a condition for success uh, could be like we uh, complete five cycles of development could be one. Another could be um, we land four paid customers. Something that I can track, something that I can measure, something, and it doesn't necessarily always need to be uh, a numeric number. It helps for sure, but something that you would be able to look at and say, yes, I've done this, or no, I haven't done this. And that's what I mean by a condition for success. It needs to have a binary answer to it. Did I do this, yes or no? The third characteristic of these goals is that they actually all had a to-do date. So is, I like to work uh, on a monthly basis with my team. So uh, every goal that we set has a month that we're, it's due by, so like the end of that month and a year. The year is more particular or more important when we're dealing with uh, multi-year strategies, but even having uh, in short term, having a week or a month deadline supports that idea of prioritization. Now, what's really interesting about a due date is just looking at your goals due dates, you can also see the type of workload you may be, your team may be under. If all of your goals are, you know, due on May 1st, you know, tomorrow is like, today is going to be a really busy day <laughs> to like get everything done by. So if you know something's due May 1st, then another thing's due May 20th, and then the next thing's due June 20th, you know, okay, there, there's some time to space out. So when there's balance in your timeline for your goals, you're able to balance the workload a little bit more effectively. This is obviously a little bit more challenging to do when there's specific builds or when something is, has a go live date, but at least then everyone knows that that is a very key milestone or a peak period of a lot of consolidated effort. So we talked about writing it down and having it shared. We have that it's, there's a condition for success, and we talked about making sure that we have a timeline. Now, the, the fourth element is that there is an owner. And oftentimes, when teams get together to talk about their goals, or it's, here's what we need to get accomplished. And what I've discovered, or what I've experienced personally as well, is that a goal really becomes potent when it only has one owner. And an owner is different than the team that supports them or the person that would uh, maybe provide budget or legal uh, assessment or um, a key insight from an advisory perspective. An owner is the one who is responsible for ensuring that the goal gets completed. So they could be the project lead, they could be that task lead, or they could just be the point person for that goal. The reason I stress out the owner so much is because 
this allows us to get outside of that's not in my job description. And often at the stage that you're in, I don't think it, it will be as common, yet as you grow, you'll start bringing on people with specific uh, job departments or job specifications that you'll want to start looking at, okay, how do I make sure that even though they have this particular skill set or we brought them in to do this part of the job, that they also know that they're responsible for X and Y goals as well or that their job contributes to X and Y goals. Having that level of accountability, that level of responsibility with your team actually brings people up to um, own their role and task more. Oftentimes they talk to leaders and what they, uh, what they say is like, oh, well, I'm, I have all these things on my plate and I like, my team is always checking in on me to get an update on the goal. And as a leader of a business, you'd actually want to invert that. Give your team, let your team be the owner of the goal so that you as the leader, you as the manager are the one who is then following up with them on the progress. You flip it so you give more responsibility to more uh, people so that you can actually manage it differently. Okay, I'd like to hear some feedback on the four different characteristics. Um, Kavita, I haven't heard from you yet. Welcome to the call. Um, tell me how you're, you use those goals or do you use different parameters to set yours? So, um, so I, I am also using Trello at the moment and I, it's quite a recent thing. So, um, yeah, so I'm interested to implement some of this. Um, I actually think, so for me, the biggest thing you point about like deadlines and things, um, and having one specific person, um, so my team only has two people in it at the moment, but, um, but I've noticed that if, if it's something that I need to do, or there's something on my list that actually shouldn't be on my list, then it kind of distracts from, I guess, like what I should actually be doing. Um, so um, quite recently, I've started being more, I guess, communicating more with um, that's on the team um, to make sure that actually, like, what's on my my Trello is like what should be on my Trello. If that makes sense. Totally. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I guess that was a specific thing. But also, um, I, so I initially didn't have deadlines in my Trello. Like, I just mm -hmm. of what I needed to do. Um, or also, like, then when I started setting deadlines, I would have deadlines for everything, even though some things don't really need a deadline. Mm. Was you that like, more distracting? Well? <laughs> You're like deadline crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and this is the. Then you have to change your deadline if you don't make it by that deadline, and then it doesn't feel right, if that makes sense. Right. And so this is where, like, elevating your to do list for, into goals also helps because the management of tasks, like, if something gets done on Monday and doesn't actually need to be done by Friday, but it's on your Monday to do list, then you'd have to kind of like move it down the the road until sometimes we need that like sense of urgency, like, okay, I got to get this done. Yeah. Um, what is interesting in that is with your, with a small team in particular, when we have clarity on who the owner is of each goal, it also allows the other person to not worry about it as much. It's like, I, I have to, like, I have to work on all of my things. I need you to work on your things too. So that makes like the team act of like the smaller the team, the more uh, beneficial having clarity around ownership of which goal and which task stream is important. Cool. Thanks, Kavita. Fardan, how do you feel in terms of your level of comfort working with these different parameters around goals? Um, it's, it's, it's something I'm learning to do. I, I think as, as I go on, um, goal development is become more of an important role in my, in my, um, career. 
it's something I struggled with when I was trying to launch my own startup. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's something that you're not exactly taught, right? So it's something most people ra- learn through experience um, or failure. Um, <laughs> so, so for me, going through that process and learning that and then now applying it to an actual career. Um, and then, you know, so it, it's something that I've, I, I would say, struggled with. But also now that I'm actually... In, in the phase of career and working along them, it's, it's something that I'm focusing more on. Mm. I, and what was the, what was your process that you use um, early on? And now what does that process look like? I think it was not having enough detail in the goals. So when, mm. when I was working at the startup, uh, you know, it was the, there were broader goals. It was like, okay, let's get this done. Uh, you know, there were multiple owners as you um, for the goals, we didn't often have enough um, timestamps or dates with the goals or completion dates. It was like, okay, let's get it done in three months, um, but not a particular set, boiled down, detailed um, mm. plan, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And I, you know, one thing that I find that I am even confronted in my own business is that with personal, like when we set internal goals or goals of a certain level of productivity or a certain milestone that we want to reach, and we don't actually have like a very hard cost to not hitting that goal. Sometimes it can be like difficult to motivate the team to work towards that big, you know, we said we'd get it done in Q1. And, you know, if it gets done in the first month of Q2, like no one's really going to notice. Like it's just us anyway. Right. Uh, what, how, what's been your experience in trying to motivate a team around goals that are maybe can be easily moved? Uh, I think it was, it was trying to prioritize in terms of how long goals can, can be completed. So uh, for me, one of the best things I've learned was getting things done. If, if something takes less than five minutes or 10 minutes, you know, you don't put it up in my task list, just get it done with. Uh, this way you're, you're kind of reducing the, the, I guess, the big junk of, of everything, right? So um, for me, it was A, prioritizing timelines, and then B, if there was something that needed a lot of attention from other team members, it was just having a lot of communication with them mm-hmm. along the way. So, you know, none of us was, were misaligned. I would add, add to that um, from my experience is that because uh, I, I definitely have, have been part of teams or love teams where um, the the goals are movable. <laughs> and I think having like a broader vision that you're working towards that's concrete and measurable. Um, for me, that's always been kind of uh, a really good way to ground your goals in some sort of real, like something that's real that you're working on from like a quarter to quarter, like year to year basis. You know, what are you actually working towards like five years from now, 10 years from now? And how do you work back from that? Um, I think that's for me, what's, what's worked to really create like a uh, context that, that makes the goals real and, and makes them matter. So, so y'all, yeah. um, it's like you read the, the, the book that we're going to be speaking from today, Marlon, way to go. Um, so one of the things that Fardan mentioned was this notion of if it's something that I can do quickly, I'm just going to go do it. And so in the chat, I just popped up a book. Um, it's a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen. And it is by far my favorite book that I've ever read on productivity. So if you're looking to streamline, you know, how do I manage all the incoming uh, tasks and activities that I need to do, David Allen subscribes to a very similar uh, philosophy as Fardan just mentioned in terms of how do I get the things off of my plate that don't take up a lot? Oh my gosh, like Kavita is holding up getting things done. Like the, the gospel has spoken, you know, like we, there we go. We have two people already um, in it, but it's a really powerful uh, structure that I recommend uh, using just to make sure that you're um, you're taking in as much information as possible without it being overload. You can take in information and then schedule it or defer it or do something with it right away. So um, definitely a book to recommend. Now, one of the things that I wanted to um, I wanted to put out a situation just to help us 
identify some of the characteristics that we talked about in what the strongest goal would be to write down. So let's say that um, there's this person, Alex, and they're a user experience manager at um, a company called Polka Socks. And they're an online store specializing in socks for professionals. And during a team meeting, Alex states, team, we need to work together to make the online shopping experience faster for our guests. So that's like the overall objective. They want to be faster for the guests. What do you feel? I'm going to give you three options. What is the strongest goal for Alex to write down for his team? Is it A, we decrease the number of steps required to complete an online order by the end of Q3? Number two, we make the online shopping experience faster by Q3. Or three, we streamline the ordering process by the end of Q3. I'll repeat all three again. So overall, they want to make the online experience faster for our guests. That's the overall objective. Should they write down the goal? We decrease the number of steps required to complete an online order by the end of Q3. Number two. We make the online shopping experience faster by Q3. Or three, we streamline the ordering process by the end of Q3. Which do you think is the strongest goal? Uh, streamline. <laughs> streamline. I don't know. I guess and why would you say streamline? I guess because the reduced number of steps could lead to bad things happening. <laughs> um, because people could be like, oh, we have to reduce the number of steps. Like, this is the goal. We, we, there must, we, you know, there's 10 steps here and we, we need to have at least nine. Like, you know what I mean? But, but someone's like, oh, well, but we need this step. Like, this is part of the thing. Anyway, so, and then the other, what was the middle one was, um, the middle one's middle too one, broad. Make the online shopping experience. Yeah. So the middle yeah, one's definitely too broad. Too broad. Too broad. Too broad. And then, there's, there's no condition for success. Yeah. We don't know what that actually means. Yeah, streamline streamline is is good. Yeah. Okay. Streamline is good. <laughs> let's let's pose it to the group. Any agreements, disagreeances? Would you vote but for another one instead? There's a there's a quote from and this is random, but Bruce Lee said, um, you know, when when you're looking to improve or something, hack away at the non-essential um, rather than focusing on adding things. So for me, the answer would be um, reducing the number of steps. Yeah, and Aldo and Greg also voted for number one. Uh, Greg, tell us why you voted for that. I voted for that basing on an article I read through the program called the Tire So I feel like basis of entrepreneurship or having a product out there is to convenience to have it as a convenient uh, product for any person using it so if you can make the steps and the process as convenient as possible i feel like it's easier for people to use your product or buy it cool okay great aldo why did you say number one well because uh for me like really concrete things like uh make it make everything easier so uh, I remember I read this book, it's called Made to Stick, and um, mm -hmm. they basically give out tips on like how to, how to express things that are going to stick in people's minds. And like, yeah, well, simple and concrete were like uh, two things that they recommended. So like, it's very simple and very concrete because like, you know, if you streamline it, like people like, like if you say streamline it, like people don't actually know what to do. So like, uh, yeah, for me, the more concrete, the better. So I would actually advocate for number one as well. And the reason I would advocate is because when a goal contains buzzwords that aren't unique to the company, like you may have a, a buzzword that is culturally appropriate given your team or given your um, industry, but things like, streamline and improve and uh, make more efficient. 
these are all buzzwords that don't actually tell the, your team what, they actu what the actual goal would be. But to Matthew's point, it's really great to also double check and see, would this goal actually decent, uh, de-incentivize some people to make the best decision. So, you know, it's not right or wrong, good or bad, just like notice, can I say this goal in a clear and specific way that doesn't have buzzwords to confuse people or to make it super broad? Is there still a clear condition for success at the end of it? All right, now, Marlon actually beat me to it because one of the things that I would say um, is fundamental to have for your team and for your organization is a vision. Because so far, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned SMART goals before. Who's heard of SMART goals before, just by show of hands? Yeah. Okay, so um, Tim, do you remember what SMART goals stands for? Oh, I can guess. Okay. Um, specific, measurable, attainable. I want to say relatable, but I'm not sure that's right. Realistic, yeah. And time? Yeah. Okay. And so I'm such a fan of specific and measurable goals. What I'm not a fan of is this notion of what's attainable and what's realistic. And I'll... And the reason I say that is because what we thought was realistic or attainable five years ago is, was probably much less than what we actually attained. So if you think about, let's just do it personally. Think about your life 10 years ago. How old you were, where you were working, where you were living, who you were hanging out with, how much money were you making? What type of health regime did you have? You know, all of that. And then type in the comments, what percentage of your life has changed? Was it like 50% of your life has changed? Is it like 92%? Like what percentage do you think your life has changed in the last 10 years? hundred percent, 98. 99, I love this. <laughs> it can be smaller, it can be bigger. Let's get a few more. 75, 65, yeah, great. So I want, like what we see from all of this is that over half, we'll say, most of our lives um, has changed pretty significantly or in some way in the last 10 years. And so this idea that it needs to be attainable or realistic can sometimes be challenged when we're innovating or when we're doing something that's never been done before. And so when we're doing something that's never been done before, what actually helps ground us in why are we doing this in the first place is a future focused vision, a picture of the future that motivates us toward that, to that body of work. Said differently, I wanna know where I'm going so that I see the relevance of what I'm working on today. I wanna know point B is Montreal so that I can get creative and I can adapt and I can change course if I need to based on the dynamic conditions that I'm gonna be working in. But I want to know that I'm going to Montreal rather than Kelowna, because those will be two very different trips from Vancouver, you know? <laughs> so um, what I want you to do now is take out a piece of paper or take out uh, or open up like a text edit or a blank, just a very simple blank sheet of paper. And let's, for the sake of this exercise today, let's go ahead 10 years. So the year will be 2029. And I want you to write down what you think will be different, what will have changed or be different about the world in 2029. Bonus is write the things that would also impact your business. So 
what trends do you think would that would would have now been taken place in 2029 that impact you know the co-working spaces the um business payments whatever industry you're in um how would that have manifested how would that have taken shape you can also look at like climate some big macro trends to start how will the world be different in 10 years And this can be both positive, it can be negative. And then add to that list, what would you like to see have changed or be different about your own life? So 10 years, if we know that anywhere between 65 to 100% of your life will change or be different, again, in the next 10 years, like what would you like it to be like? Where would you wanna live? What type of activities do, would you want to be doing for fun? How much money would you be making? What type of business would you want to be leading? Would it be the one that you're working on right now? Would you have bought, like sold this one and started your next two? And would you be the head of the company still? What would your family and friend relationships look like? And then fill in any details that you would also want to see or that would describe your life the world from a macro perspective or like a really specific perspective of what would you just like to do to enjoy your life 10 years from now? Maybe it's a certain amount of money. Maybe it's a certain experience that you've always wanted to have. You've already had it by then. Um, maybe it's a certain educational experience that you would develop you that you're looking forward to having in the next 10 years. Maybe a certain milestone with a partner, both business or romantic. And then I'd love to hear from two different people. Um, what were some of the things that you wrote down? Can I, can I go? Yeah, I'll do. Okay, uh, well, I think I wrote like uh, my vision related to the business I am in right now. So, well, this is my vision for 10 years from now. <laughs> Gentrification will cause real estate to be rented out in smaller time periods and will be sold as a service, not as a commodity anymore. People will have access to most services in the ease of their home and most malls will disappear. And uh, as as uh, and related to myself is like it's like I want to create an enduring company that creates change in people's lives, and hopefully I will be married and won't be attached to one place in the world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and is there like when you say a place, do you mean like a physical 
dwelling or like a city location? Yeah, like a city location. Okay, cool. Yeah, and when you read that, how do you feel? Good. <laughs> yeah. What feels good about it? I I don't know, like uh, um, like the hope of it, like uh, yeah, like hope makes it feel good, I guess. Yeah, it's like oh, I have something to look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like these things are going to come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. One more. Marlon, what's on your list? Um, on my list, I have... Um... <laughs> Uh, very similar to Aldo, actually. Um, I, I want to be bi-coastal. <laughs> mm. That's a big one. Um, and I want to be working three days a week. Amen. <laughs> Would you be still moon, uh, being a spin instructor as well? Um, so that's like a little known fact. So I don't think many people want to respond to that. <laughs> um, Ten years probably. 10 years, probably not. All right. My body is no. <laughs> Would you want to be able to do that, though? I would, I'd want to enjoy fitness um, in okay. a different way, I think. Yeah. So the be beautiful thing about 10 years, sometimes people will downplay what is possible in 10 years mm -hmm. in terms of like, oh, you know, at, at that age, I, I won't be able to do my favorite activity anymore. Or, you know, I won't be able to have the stamina to be this level of leader in that company. And what I offer is that when we have a vision of a certain level of health or a certain level of success we want to experience in our career, um, or even the quality of our relationships, to dream a little bit bigger, to consider that if we set that as the goal, if we set that as the intention, then we can actually make choices now that will impact or motivate us toward achieving that level of success or that level of health or that level of, of happiness in the, in the future. That was my long-winded way of saying, know that you could have a goal to be a spin instructor still. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So when you have a vision, and this was like a really simple uh, and probably more cerebral way of creating a vision, other times people will think of them from a, a visual perspective. So flipping through magazines and cutting out um, Ob like cutting out phrases and pictures that resonate with what they hope a 10-year life looks like. You see it often in vision boards. I've seen uh, some of my cousins who are younger than me, they have Pinterest boards that are their vision boards. Um, and so anytime they're scouring the internet, they see something that is aspirational for them, they just pin it to one of their boards. So there's lots of different ways to create a vision book cover. So if you were going onto Audible and you wanted that like brief little snippet of what's the book about, consider writing a vision in the same format. So a vision, five to seven sentences that describe what is actually happening in the moment in that vision. So um, it, it can sound an, a number of different ways. But it's written instead of not like, I will have this, it's I have this. So it's written in the present tense, but in that future state. And I like to consider that the vision introduces like the main themes or the main characters that are involved in that 10 year picture, because what it actually allows for then is um, me to fill in the blanks like having a little bit of gray area is okay in a vision in my opinion 
What's different though, is that I want to write it using language that motivates me. So what Aldo was pointing to is like actually like giving some hope. I was like, when I, when I said it, like there was, I, I was something to look forward to. Just like when you read the back of a book cover and it says, here's what's going on in this book. And you're like, oh man, I want to read this book. My recommendation is to write your vision in a way that when you read your vision, you're like, I want to live that life. Like that's the life that I want to have. That is inspiring. That motivates me. The vision is the high level picture that you, mm. that you want to keep intact and prominent somewhere in um, your office, your laptop, your shared documents, wherever it is, but you want to keep it, um, keep that picture alive. Now this is different than a vision statement that some companies may have. I'm all for a vision statement, but I wanna know the picture of the world. I wanna know what's different. I wanna know how the world has changed or is, has transformed because I took action uh, along the way. So things like bi coastal, running an organization that is successful, um, those are broad strokes at, or broad declarations of the type of life you want to, to lead. Vision, five to seven sentences written in a way that's inspiring to you. I used to have mine on the back of my uh, uh, medicine cabinet in my bathroom. So every time I would like open up the medicine cabinet to get to brush my teeth, I would like read my vision as I brushed my teeth. And they just kept it top of mind of like, why am I going to work today? Like, why am I getting ready? Like, what's the point? What am I working toward? I didn't need to look at a Trello or an Asana or like a long Google sheet when I, like, I, I had all that in a laptop. But to me, it was really important to have a more personal experience of like the vision that I'm working toward. Does anyone have other alternatives to how they keep the vision alive in their organization or in your household? Mine is the similar to yours. I have like at home, I have like a little den with like a bunch of whiteboards. And then like on the whiteboard above my computer, I have like long term goals. And then usually when I, if I have friends over, they always like write funny stuff on the board behind like my friend wrote you are a lion and drew a little lion on the thing. I like that. <laughs> uh, I love he, that. He's my like goals on the thing and he's like, this guy's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so, so more, uh, it, in front of me. Yeah. It gives me the opportunity to look at something and I don't have to think about it. Like having it documented means it's out of my head. I don't have to remember why I'm doing it. It, 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 it reminds me why I'm doing it. Justin, what's your experience with visions or playing with personal or, or company visions? Um, yeah, I mean, I write a lot of stuff down, um, kind of a, I guess more of a personal one. So a few years ago, my uh, roommate and I, we, we painted this uh, picture together, this big canvas and we called it the contract. Uh, and then on the back, we like on the back of it, we wrote out, I, like, I forget the exact word because it was more of a paragraph form, but basically we both signed this, this paper on the back saying that we were uh, not going to, we we're basically just going to continuously work towards our goals and our visions. Uh, and we like signed it on paper that we can't, uh, can't give that up. And then we put the big, big mural on the wall. Um, so that I guess is kind of like a, the, the personal one. So I see that painting pretty much every day when I get home. Um, but in terms of did like, you have specific um, goals that you were working toward or just like the broad stroke of like, Hey, go after your goals. It was more. Yeah. So we didn't put our specific dreams, I guess, in our, our, our vision, but, um, I, like, I know I'm pretty, I've stayed pretty consistent, um, throughout my entire life, to be honest, of, of what I want to, uh, achieve, but no, I haven't, I haven't actually written down just like a, you know, a uh, few sentences of that vision, but I'm definitely uh, going to do that after, after this. Cool. Um, but in terms of company respect. vision, say that again? Yeah, keep going. And then company vision, uh, same sort of deal. Like um, it's, it's shared with, with our team and whatnot. Like we have 
uh, kind of like our brand documents and our kind of one pagers of like what we're trying to accomplish and what we want to achieve, etc. And where do you keep that for your team? Uh, on our Trello board and on, in our Slack channels. Okay, cool. Yeah, we uh, we have a Slack channel in my office that just says it's uh, the hashtag is goals, and that's the um, every quarter we update our progress toward towards our goals, but also we have a pinned um, a pinned message that shows here are the goals that we're working on this quarter, and this is what we're um, this is why we're doing what we're doing. So it's a nice way of keeping track. Anyone else have a different methodology? We have whiteboards, we have Trellos, anything else that you'd like to share that would be useful for this group? All right. So when we have a vision, the first thing that we would do is, or the first thing we would do is document our vision. And then that to me is our starting point to work our way backward. So often people would start setting goals from today going forward. And what I would advocate is set your vision and work your way backward. So if you know that in 10 years you want to run a full marathon, well, in five years, what would be the halfway point that would indicate you're halfway toward your goal? Running a half marathon. And then you use that five-year goal as your benchmark to set your one-year goal. And so your one-year goal would be what can I do this year that gets me one step closer to achieving that five-year goal? And so it may be, I'm going to run a 5K this year. I'm going to do my very first run race, and that gets me one step closer to achieving my five-year goal, which I know is halfway towards achieving my 10-year goal. This also demands our 10-year goals to be a little bit bigger than expected like dream a little bit bigger, have a little bit more gusto in your 10 year vision. Because if you find that you're getting into, when you trickle your goals backward and you notice, oh, my one year goal is like, make a phone call to this person. It's not necessarily a goal anymore, it's a task. And it can get really completed really quickly. So maybe that 10 year goal that you set could actually be your five year goal um, instead. Does everyone understand that trickle back experience? So working from a vision and coming backward rather than setting a goal from today going forward? Nod, shakes, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm awesome. I'm to hear your thoughts, uh, not, to, not to diverge from the conversation, but do you think if we write it down, um, your brain is tricked into looking for those opportunities? Like if it's in front of you day in, day out, you're, you're subconsciously looking for those opportunities and making those connections. Is, is that what's happening here at some level? So what I would offer is that often people talk about when you write down a goal, it switches from one side of your brain to another, and that's false. It doesn't actually happen. <laughs> However, when I write down a goal, it does free up the brain capacity that was required to keep it top of mind. And that switches into um, what you were talking about in terms of like, I then can use that to figure out how to make it happen. So uh, people would start talking about, oh yeah, like just opportunities appeared because I was then focused on different things. I was able to see ways of accomplishing my goal instead of trying to remember the goal itself. Mm -hmm. So for me, the like writing it down aspect of it is actually just to like free up mental space. Gotcha. Yeah. As what I want you to do now is write out a five year goal that would be based on the 10 year vision, draft vision that you uh, wrote down. So looking at some of those key bullets, looking at some of the descriptions of the way the world is, what would be a five year goal, a goal 
that would indicate that you are halfway toward accomplishing that level of success or that uh, change in the world. And let's just say the owner is gonna be you. So make it a goal that you would work toward. And in five years, that would be 2024. And so pick your favorite month in 2024, unless you already know your schedule. <laughs> I haven't met anyone who actually knows their schedule five years from now. So that's why I just say, pick your favorite month. <laughs> And then consider, okay, I'm writing it down, perfect. Is there a condition for success? Is there a clear yes and no? Have it, would I be able to say by that month in time, yes, I've achieved that or no, I haven't? Matthew, what was your five-year goal? Uh, my five-year goal, uh, the first one is built products that millions of people have used. Uh, the second one is started a family. And the third one is healthy. And in that, I mean, I can run and play sports without puking. Beautiful. <laughs> so this is what I love. If you just said, I can run and play sports, I would be like, I don't know. I don't know if that's like a yes or no, because like, does it mean how fast you run? Does it mean what kind of sports? Like it's pretty vague. But then the actual beautiful thing is the qualifier is without puking. So if you like went for a run and didn't yeah, puke, it'd be said, like, great, you said, like accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, maintain healthy. I can, I can run and play sports now without puking, but I mean like, I don't want to ever, you know, be unhealthy and like not be able to like get up and walk around. Yeah. <laughs> And what I love that you pointed to is um, for our, uh, in my personal goal setting practice, I like to use goals as a way to also make sure that I'm living a balanced life. So making sure that I have goals in my, for my career, goals for my personal life, goals for my health, goals, um, and you can choose categories that resonate with you. It could be adventure and finance and education, like whatever categories matter to you, pick those three categories and set goals within those. It also ensures that when you have balanced goals, you have a balanced life because you're prioritizing multiple things that, or you're setting a clear objective in each of those domains of your life so that, you know, when I, I was, uh, a good friend of mine's a lawyer and he was like, I don't like goals. Why do you tell people to set goals? He's like, I just got totally burnt out from setting too many goals in my career. I just like taken over my life and I have no social life. And I was like, oh, well, what were some of your personal goals that you had? He's like, I didn't have any. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> and what about your health goals? He's like, I didn't have any of those either. I was like, well, of course you got burnt out. You didn't have like, there's no balance in your goals. So of course, you only focused on one side of your life and therefore got totally burnt out. So I can totally get why he was like anti-goals. <laughs> Thankfully, he's changed his ways and is now focusing on other areas of his life as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think and that. so now looking at your five-year goals. Oh, go ahead, Matthew. Yeah, I was just going to like reinforce that, that like having, having the balance is extremely important, especially when you work at a desk. So. Yeah, it's, it's like key if you're not, I mean, there were points when I was not exercising and, and it was not going well. <laughs> yeah. I get that. Healthy leaders lead healthy businesses. That's what we always say. Um, now, when you look at your five-year goals, l take a step back even more to today and consider that your five-year goal is actually the, you know, where you are today and where you are now out or sorry where you are today and where you want to go where you want to go is your five-year goals what is one thing or in this case one thing in each area of your life that you could do this year 
that would get you one step closer to your five-year goals? What is one thing that you could do this year that would get you closer to your five-year goals? Take a moment and write those down. And if you want to write them down in three different domains, do that as well. This is just like practice, setting a goal from a, from a 10 year vision. Matthew, I'm going to pick on you again because we know your five-year goal. So we want to know where, what some one-year goals would be so we can see the trickle back in, a, in, a, in its effect. I've got like there a comedic go. part of this. But, um, anyway, uh, so I'm just writing them now. Um, so like the first one would be uh, launch a product to get people using it. <laughs> like, you know. 10 people, whatever. Do you have how many people? Um, okay, write down 10. Write down 10. Yeah. Write down 10. Get people and get, I'm going to say 50. I mean, got to be ambitious. Get 50 people using it. Um, okay. Read five books. I had read 50 books in my five year goal. So I was like, read five books. I know that doesn't add up to five books a year, but I'll increase my, my book productivity. Um, and then my five, my started a family one. The funny one was like, get my girlfriend pregnant. <laughs> but like, I won't do that. Uh, I'll just say like, maintain a healthy relationship with my girlfriend. <laughs> Nobody laughs, so I don't know if that's funny or not. <laughs> one of the things that I want you to know. Well, I, here's the thing. Um, there's a interesting philosophy because some people would say like, I'm not gonna write down, get married or have kids or you know, personal goals because they, the argument is, well, I don't have a lot of control over those things. And I would argue you have the same amount of control around your personal life and your personal relationships as you do with your career. You can work your butt off and maybe only 10 people buy your product and you set out to do 50. You could also work your butt off and go on so many dates and find the person of your dreams. Or you may have just gone on a bunch of horrible first dates. So since we have the same amount of control, same amount of influence in our personal lives and our career, that they all require other people to validate, to support, and to um, help us create those ideas. So I would argue like be bold and write down like what you really want to have happen in your personal life, just like you do in your career. Again, balanced goals for a balanced life. So I know Matthew, you meant it as a, as a humorous thing, but I do want you to know like, Hey, I've seen people have those as goals because it does take work. It does take effort. There's a lot of trial and error that takes place. So <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm 25 and and she's 26, so I don't think we're we're quite there yet. <laughs> so yeah, so then, and also don't write down goals that you're not serious about cuz man the the yeah. world works in beautiful I, ways. <laughs> I put maintain a healthy relationship, but that's probably not enough of a like you said, I'm now I'm reframing it. It should be like how do you what's the goal to maintain that healthy relationship? What's the tangible thing, right? How do people maintain healthy relationships? So that's yeah. that's yeah. And maybe you could even look at, you know, what would be a characteristic of our relationship that would say, like, we have date night once a month for us, or we go on two yeah, trips with our best friends. <laughs> They're like, I don't know. You know? Um, you're you're running like, a business. You're couples you can be set date nights. <laughs> I know a lot of couples that are new that still have to set date nights. Anyway, you should w listen to Esther Perel um, because Mating in Captivity, I'm just full of books today. Mating in Captivity is such a good book for anyone interested in making sure you keep your relationships alive. They talk about how when you're 21, you date a certain way, but then when you're like 27, all of a sudden things change. And the reality is you want to keep the, keep the practices 
that you used when you were 21 alive. So anyway, what does that have to do with goals? Everything. Because <laughs> in the name of creating a life that you love, you want to know where you're going. And so by setting out a really strong vision of what that future looks like, you're then able to trickle those goals back from five years to one year and write them in a way that is specific, that has a quantifiable measure of success, that has an owner and a by when date. One owner, one by when date. And if the cost of missing that by when date isn't communicated or high enough, it will tend to shift. So make sure that when you write them, that there's also some either reward or cost so that your team and your community know what you're, they're working toward so that they can be as efficient and effective as possible in getting there. My experience of goals is that when people are get into the practice of it, um, I saw Chip Wilson was a speaker uh, with this cohort uh, previously, and he taught me that you should fail at 50% of your goals. And I loved that uh, philosophy because it changes our relationship to failure. It gives us the ability to say, I didn't meet 50% of my goals, and I'm okay because I'm playing a big enough game. And even if I wanted 100, 100 new clients and I got 75, yeah, I missed the goal, but I got 75 clients. Like it's so much better than if I set the bar at 50 and got 45 clients. So set your bar high, allow your goals to feel big and audacious because if you're really committed to changing the world, if you're really committed to creating something that was different, then I want you to make sure that your goals reflect that. And your one-year goals will support you in taking that one step this year to achieve your long-term vision. All right, we are going to wrap it up here. Uh, Marlon, thank you so much for bringing me in and having uh, me available to these, these folks. And I just wanted to also make mention that if you want to stay connected, um, please feel free to add me to LinkedIn or feel free to find me on social at Matt underscore Corker. Um, I'd love to know how well your business is doing in the coming months, in the coming years. And if I can be of any assistance to yourself or to your teams, uh, know that you have a champion in your corner. So um, how we'll end off today's call is the same way we do before everyone take yourself off of mute and we'll say goodbye. See you later, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Bye. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>